You're watching Holistic Newborn Care by Dr. Lisa Gall on Resonance Wellness TV, part of our Helping Dr. Mom series that seeks to inspire and educate about natural health and holistic family life. So, um, good evening everyone and welcome to this presentation on Holistic Newborn Care. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Dr. Alyssa Gall and I am a naturopathic doctor in Calgary, Alberta, Canada who has been helping moms keep their kids healthy the natural way since 1998. I'm also a trained anthroposophic physician and for those of you familiar with Waldorf, I apply this very important approach to my medical practice. I absolutely love supporting people who are motivated to improve their understanding of holistic health. I am motivated to help you and your newborn reach optimum levels of health by learning holistic care and treatments that hopefully ultimately benefit you both in the long run. So if you have questions during our time together, please feel free to post them on the chat box and I will do my best to answer. Our lecture tonight comes uh, out of the Nurture Natural Care series from Helping Dr. Mom. And for many years I did in-person courses with parents about natural health and the philosophy of parenthood. Nowadays everyone's online and so I've had to make the switch too. And on Helping Dr. Mom, you will see our parent-oriented lectures on the events page and the courses on the courses page. And for participants of this lecture, I am offering 40% off my Best Basics course, um, which teaches you the herbal, homeopathic, and common sense remedies for taking care of your kids at home. Just stay tuned to hear the code at the end. So, while many aspects um, of holistic healthcare are really still being explored, there are certain things that are universal to it. I mean, encouraging healthy choices for both parents and babies to introduce an elevated level of health into their lives is the goal. And what I found is that parents who um, choose to follow a holistic healthcare practice are automatically seeking to create a solid foundation for health and well-being from which their child can start life. And today we're going to be talking through various aspects of newborn health and care as a new parent and maybe even a parent the second time around, but doing it a little bit differently. Now, it's possible that you've already had your little one and so that the first moments are now just a sweet memory. But if you haven't yet given birth, I'd like to encourage you to have skin to skin contact with your newborn baby as soon as they emerge from the womb. This welcome into the world from womb to arms to breast, warmed with towels and in the kangaroo position is ideal. Babies suck most forcefully right after birth than if they're forced to wait. So if you get them up onto the breast quickly, it's really ideal. There's also no need to wipe off the vernix caseosa, and that's the white creamy substance that covers the newborn skin at birth. Just let it get absorbed by the skin in the first few hours, you know, to maybe a half a day. Your baby can be wiped gently if there's a trace of blood or something like that on the skin. Um, and there's also a fine pale hair on babies that will eventually disappear over the first few months. Uh, it's called lanugo. And it's more likely to be on a baby that, that's premature, but the odd kid will still have it even if they're not. So babies obviously are now t often taken from moms immediately following birth, you know, and sometimes that's necessary for medical reasons. But, you know, connecting mom with child and ensuring that human connection is is established you know they've just spent a whole nine months inside another human <laughs> so as quickly as you can create that bonding experience after birth it's ideal a mom's skin and natural touch helps to regulate a baby's temperature breathing and metabolism in the immediate moments after birth and this advantage is huge in ensuring a child grows up to maintain good health and regulates all major shifts between their existence pre and post birth a newborn is so small and inexperienced in the world and their breathing is usually very quiet and you can observe their eyeballs kind of swimming under their closed lids. That space between sleeping and waking is very vague in an infant. <laughs> they don't really focus well on objects and when the eyes are open, a newborn will look like they're looking for something and then the eyes close again. It's gradual. They're, they're slowly easing into the world around them. Their environment should be quiet and the lighting should be muted and motions and touch should be soft and firm. Just imagine what it would be like to be suddenly thrust into bright lights after being in such a darkened place. All of the sun senses are just so impressionable in a newborn. You want their introduction to the world to be a gradual one. Newborn hearing is pretty much fully functional upon birth, but they have no experience of associating a sound 
with something that seems normal to you and me. So you're going to restrict mechanical noises around a baby, as well as loud music or TV or raised voices. We're going to talk about useful sounds in a few slides. In the entire first year of life, sound, touch, light, and temperature cannot be shut out by a child. The whole body is sensitive and impressionable, and poor choices at this time can really be a shock. You know, fresh air, humidity, sunlight, heat, and cold should all be monitored and adjusted as necessary. Um, in the anthroposophic approach, a soft wool undergarment is excellent for this. Um, since wool is super absorbent without changing its insulating properties, it really can help keep the baby warm and dry, uncomfortable, without too much effort. Again, you might already have your little one in your arms, and while it's often a necessity for moms to have a hospital birth where health complications and external factors might make this a priority, there's many benefits of home birth with a trained attendant where it's possible. In recent years, birthing practices have started to come back around to the old-fashioned home birth. And hospital births, really, they began as a sign of prestige for those wealthy enough to afford health care. And gradually, you know, the use of pain relievers and highly medicated births became really a norm. And so women just didn't consider giving birth without them. And so that shift from um, birth in the home really began um, out towards a medical facility. Um, in terms of recovery time and effectiveness, though, it's still safer to proceed with an unmedicated childbirth. While the pain can be greater, the overall time taken to return both mom and baby to a stable state of comfortable body function is really most effect efficient when interventions during birth are minimized. Of course, I could give you an entire course on this preparation that we really just don't have time for here. Um, here on this slide, we're actually seeing the white Vernix caseosa on this little girl that has just been born in a water birth. This is her mom sitting in the tub. Um, and so you're going to just want to let that sit for a while <laughs> and be rubbed in. It kind of looks like zinc oxide to cream to me after uh, uh, at the end of the day. So it, it will just soak in. And we're going to talk about that again in a second. I would really encourage you also to watch videos of normal home births if you've never attended one yourself. I've been shocked to see what birth is represented to be like on TV. There's people running around, there's bright lights, there's blood, there's screaming, there's patronizing or very dismissive attendance. It's all a little much. I think one of the midwives I used to work with once told me she could have a woman give birth in an all-white living room without a speck of blood anywhere, but it seemed like births in the hospital always were accompanied by a mess. So regardless of what you plan for your child's birth at present, you can consider elements of natural birth without within any plan. Now, after birth, um, in the environment in the immediate period should be kind of covered in your birth plan if you've got one. Um, the early days following this initial entry into the world are important. And it's basically the fourth trimester, so it's the three months after a child is born that really should ideally take place within a pretty steady environment. So the more changes that take place during this period, the harder it often is for a baby to settle into routine. So for that first couple of weeks to months, try to limit visitors to a minimum. And those visits that do occur, keep them short. Um, short visits can tire out mom and dad, or mom and dad <laughs> and baby at this crucial stage. And it's important to also make sure that visitors and, and other kids wash hands before touching your baby to ensure minimum, you know, contamination from unfamiliar external sources. Most of the time, that's not a big deal, but most of us actually get um, a lot of like colds and flu type things from hand contact. So just ask people to like wash their hands. Keep your environment smoke free. Um, I mean, that goes without saying, and I don't have very many people in my practice who smoke anymore, um, but it's quite a contaminant, and we don't want little babies breathing that. And in fact, it's one of the major risk factors for homophilus influenza. Also, maintain a pretty temp um, comfortable temperature. Um, you know, an ideal nursery temperature is about 68, probably to 70 degrees. In anthroposophic medicine, we also recommend that a pale pink or violet sheer cover be put over a bassinet or a crib to filter the light in a specific way. Uh, remember to keep your mattress where your baby sleeps clear of any toys or obstructive bumpers or blankets that could get tangled up. Um, and hopefully, you know, 
this little one shows such peace here. I'm pretty sure there's a little light in this bassinet. <laughs> I didn't take this picture. Um, but you want nice, um, peaceful environment for your child. Not a 100% not a sterile environment, not a 100% noiseless environment, um, because a certain amount of noise is, um, is fine, but just peaceful. Now, breastfeeding is one of the most beneficial things a mom can do to ensure there's baby's health. It's an incredible bonding experience. It's very convenient. It changes really significantly over time to be appropriate for your baby's changing needs. And it helps with involution, which is where the uterus contracts back down to its normal size in the first days to weeks. It transfers passive immunity to your child because you basically give antibodies through breast milk. It protects children against digestive issues and infections. It protects longer term against the development of allergies. And for mom, it helps to lose baby weight. Newborns really should have unrestricted access to breast milk in early days. This really does encourage better a pattern of nursing to appear because the baby's learning how to eat and you're learning how to breastfeed. Um, so usually that settles out the time between feedings um, to about two hours um, when the pattern starts to become apparent and then slowly the length in between feedings will increase to about three or four hours. A feeding usually lasts about 20 minutes for both sides or at least one side fully and a little on the other side. A child is not spoiled by unrestricted breastfeeding. A, a child does not intentionally manipulate feeding behaviors to make you crazy. <laughs> the beginning months of nursing are a slow introduction to building relationship through the trust of providing your baby's basic needs. Other effects of breastfeeding you might not have been aware of include a delay of the return of the menstrual period. Um, babies that have, basically all babies have a sticky kind of tar-like substance called meconium in their intestines. And breast milk actually is really excellent at moving that through. Um, colostrum or the most early part of breast milk is really uniquely designed to help move uh, meconium through the infant's body. Um, and in the very beginning of nursing, you're not going to have like eight ounce bottles coming out of your breast. You're going to have a little bit of sticky, thick, yellowish colostrum showing up, um, like in the tablespoonfuls kind of quantity, um, and not all at once. And um, it, it takes time to start to actually get full milk. Sometimes it takes up to two or three days for the full milk to come in. Um, your baby is still getting colostrum and other, you know, concentrated factors. So don't worry. They're, they're meant to survive this period without like massive amounts of milk coming out. Breast milk is really more digestible than formula. Um, there have been many attempts to make formula be like breast milk. The more we re research about breast milk, the more we realize we can't replicate it in a bottle. Um, again, there's hidden, there's elements of it that every once in a while get, get discovered and then added in. A great example of that is that breast milk is chock full of undigestible stuff that's entirely meant to encourage the development of the baby's microbiome. That's all of the normal bacteria that take up residence in the gastrointestinal tract and become part of so many functions in the human being. Um, and of course, we didn't really discover that until um quite recently and so formula historically hasn't had any of that in nowadays they're starting to put more of those kinds of things in but it's nothing near like what you could produce now of course if you're really having difficulty breastfeeding and you have to resort to formula don't worry about that either there's other ways around improving microflora and even if you can get a little bit of breast milk and then top it up with formula that's totally fine too whatever you can do now the key to consuming healthy diets for breastfeeding is simply really to consume a diet that's healthy and balanced for you. And while there's many options and opinions and recommendations for moms to consume certain foods um, in either increased or decreased amounts to ensure proper nutrition, finding the healthy balance of nutrients for you as a mom is the best way to make sure the baby also receives them. So if you're regularly eating a healthy balanced diet that's pretty rich in nutrients, your baby is also going to receive these and so the energy is going to be balanced enough to maintain both of you at a healthy level of nutrition. If there are bigger questions about diet, the basic rules for diet apply. A half plate of non-starchy vegetables, fat and protein in a quarter of the plate, 
less than 10% fruit, about 10% starch, some sea vegetables and ferments for decor. Now, if you have health issues, you could consider doing metabolic typing, which I do do at the clinic, to figure out where the weak spots and the strong spots of your diet are. If you're consuming a diet that's low in calories or deficient in nutrients and minerals, your body will start to draw natural reserves to make up the deficit. Meaning that while your baby will get all that positive beneficial element, you'll eventually notice that you too might become deficient. And there's an old midwifery expression for every baby a tooth. And now research have actually discovered that women who have three children have on average four fewer teeth than those who had just two babies. Um, this was in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health. And it was a professor, Stefan Listel, of the Department of Dentistry in um, Radboud University. Um, and I, I don't know what how to say the city name, but I think it's um, Nemean. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> it's in the Netherlands. Anyways, um, they had said in their study that our study provides unique and novel evidence for causal links between the number of natural children and missing teeth. The more babies, the more tooth loss reported over time. It decreases with education, so you don't lose as many teeth if you're smarter. And it doesn't, of course, affect fathers. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So ensuring your diet is balanced ahead of your journey towards breastfeeding can be a great way to make sure you're consuming the right amount of nutrients um, just before a baby is born. And it, and it probably will protect against tooth loss. <laughs> I thought you guys might get a kick out of that. Now, the five S's. There's a period, like I said, of three months following birth that's been coined the fourth trimester, in which an infant's senses, movements, and reactions to the world around them are more responsive to the inside conditions of the womb than those on the outside. It's almost like it takes about this long to fully transition into the world outside. So to get used to taking up a little bit more space bodily and in harsher external conditions. And so for this reason, you can learn to soothe and pacify your baby using similar conditions as you would find in the womb. So swaddling, soft touch, snug holding, keeping a baby warm, and using natural movement like swaying is really effective when trying to soothe them because they recognize it. The rhythms experienced in the womb trigger a baby to relax. And so when you emulate those rhythms, it serves as a natural on-off switch for an upset newborn. And it seems like random effects of rocking a baby back and forth or taking them for a drive. Um, but it's probably actually emulating the gentle movements of being inside the womb. And so holistic newborn care advocates some of these simple techniques. Um, there is a Dr. Harvey Karp. I'm, I don't know if you've read his book or not or seen it. Um, I think it's called The Happiest Baby on the Block. And he followed the example of an African tribe, and it's a tribe that I actually studied in university. They have clicks in their language, so the tribal name is, um, it says exclamation mark Kung, but how it's pronounced is a click, Kung. So um, they actually, he actually observed them and, and noticed that they did five very specific things. One was they swaddled their babies. So the first S is swaddling. So if they're if a child's fussy um, or sleeping, they swaddle baby so that the arms are firmly wrapped to the sides with the legs and hips a little bit more free and the head free. And then they also held the baby in a side or stomach position, um, which appears to be best for calming a baby, not lying on the back. So you hold them on your side with, your back, with their backs against your stomach or the other way. Um, and then the third S is shushing. So the sound of shush, like shh, 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 is a lot like the sound of your blood rushing around the uterus when your baby is still inside. And babies seem to really calm with sounds that are like that. The fourth S is swinging. So a side to side jiggle, head supported, about an inch or two side to side. So if you hold them in your lap with their your hand supporting your head and you just jiggle them back and forth slightly. This is not big movements, it's just little jiggles, really fast little jiggles that really seems, it imitates again a, a womb movement and that seems to calm them down. And then fifth S is sucking. Sucking calms babies. And so that's either on your breast or on a fingertip like a baby finger um, with the pad of your finger pointed up towards the top of their mouth um, or a pacifier that's well shaped. Now, when you look at a baby's development, it's, it's slow over time. A baby doesn't have the same experiences as an older child or a parent um, or even a toddler. 
So we've already talked a little bit about the senses and how they're different at birth, and they take time to develop into something that you would recognize. You need to protect space around an infant to ensure that they're not overwhelmed, because when they're overwhelmed, you're not going to follow far behind. <laughs> so that said, it's really important that you continue to participate in your own life. You know, baby fits into your life, not the other way around. And I don't mean the enforcement of, uh, enforcement of a schedule, but rather that you, you yourself should eat first, shower first, do what you need to do to be a caregiver. No baby, newborn, has walked away from a mat in the middle of the bathroom while you wash your hair. So no baby will be unhappy strapped to you when you power walk. And to speak to being strapped in, like this picture shows, I'd love to have you consider a great sling. A car seat is not a great thing for you or for your baby. It is for transporting babies in cars. So get yourself a comfy sling, take your baby out of the car seat, jam them in there, um, and your baby can accompany you while your hands remain free to do what needs doing. Having the baby's dad have their own sling is also an excellent idea. I cannot tell you how many times I had been in a plane or a busier place with my son tucked into a sling, and people were shocked that a baby was present because he was happy or he was sleeping or nursing or whatever he needed to do in there. So please consider it. There's a, a great shop close to our clinic that's called Babes in Arms, and they have a great selection of things that you can go and take a look at, and you can just find one that's comfortable for you. The next thing is to take a look at reading baby cues. It might seem obvious, but you know, reading baby cues can start to be, well, it starts out as being a bit difficult. It takes a while to develop an understanding of what their signals are with respect to things like crying, gas, hunger, fussiness, illness, etc. And those cues can be subtle, such as they're rubbing their ears or their eyes, um, or it can start to become more obvious and alarming when they start to make crying noises. So whatever it is, you're going to be familiarizing yourself with your baby's patterns, um, and you want to be able to respond to their needs accordingly or in the most beneficial matter. So you don't have to be clueless. You can actually, there's an, actually a system for reading your baby's vocalizations that basically apply to all babies in the first few months. And this is known as Dunstan baby language. Now, I have to say big blessings to the patient who gave me the Dunstan baby language CD when my own baby was in utero. And Dunstan baby language is basically um, the work of a woman who's a musician. I believe she's a singer, actually. Um, and she recognized, she, she had a newborn baby of her own, and she started to realize that there were certain sounds that the baby made for certain um, requirements. And she made this amazing um, video of this. She, she basically kind of proved that they, all these newborn babies make pretty much the same sound. It doesn't matter what culture you're in or any of that. Um, and here's the sounds they make. The first sound is ne, like N-E-H. Um, it's like obviously the very beginning syllable to nursing practically. <laughs> and that is the sound that babies make when they're hungry. So when their cries have a distinct N sound at the very beginning, you can be pretty rest assured that they're just looking for a boob. Um, second sound is A, 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 like E-H. That is a sound for upper gas. And that means they need to be burped. So a lot of the time they will make that noise after they've nursed. And you want to actually burp them until they stop making the noise. That's very important. Um, sometimes bam, moms give up a little bit too early on burping. Um, and then they get the opposite problem, which is gas in the lower bowel. And that sound sounds a lot more like um, a discomfort in the lower bowel. It's kind of like an uh sound. So um, phonetically, that's spelled like E-I-A-R-H. And that really represents that they've now got swallowed gas in the lower bowels and now they are uncomfortable. So if you can catch it when it's just A-E-H, and burp them and take as long as it takes. Sometimes it can take five, 10 minutes of burping a kid before they stop making them. Keep on um, going with that until they stop making the noise. The other two sounds are um, a heh sound for being uncomfortable. Usually that means like there's something pinching them, like a, a diaper or they're getting too hot or you know they're getting too cold. So you're going to look for, you know, what are your conditions like around the baby when they start making that noise. And last but not least, they make kind of an O oh sound when they get tired. So it's like an O-W-H. Of course, a lot of the time people recognize that sound because people often stretch and make that noise, right? They're like, oh. 
And babies make it too. So that saved me so much trouble when I first learned it. And um, sure enough, when my son was born, he made those noises. And I realized that by that time, I'd been taking kids for like almost 10 years and babies in particular. And I realized I'd been hearing those sounds all along, but I just didn't recognize them. So blessings to Priscilla Dunstan, who made this um, uh, a reality. <laughs> Now, while it's important to remember, obviously, that babies are crying naturally, and maybe they're even going to give you that sound for lower bowel gas, it's still really uncomfortable and unsettling for new parents that are unaccustomed to pacifying screaming newborns, especially if they can't figure out in the first cue what to do. Um, so colic um, as a diagnosis is generally diagnosed if your baby is crying for about three hours a day for at least three days a week for three consecutive weeks. In essence, it's intense periods of crying, um, often accompanied by clenched fists, and a lot of the time they'll arch their backs and they recoil to touch. Those are all symptoms of colic. Um, there are no conclusive causes of it. There's lots of theories, and people t um, try different methods of treatment, um, both natural and medicinal, to relieve babies. And when I get a colicky baby in the clinic, we want to check a couple of things. Is there a possible tongue or lip tie? Um, are they just not feeding ad adequately to get like a full meal? And are they basically staying on long enough to get hind milk? So this is kind of part of the same problem. Um, if a baby is only getting the fast um, front end of the milk, it's, it's a lot more um, lactose rich in the very beginning and not as fat rich. So basically you, you pump out a little bit of like sugary treat in the very beginning to get the energy up. And then the fatty part of the milk follows a bit later when the nursing has gone on for a little bit more time. But sometimes if kids don't have a great latch or they don't stay on long enough on the side or mom's switching them off or taking them off too prematurely, um, they get a lot more buildup of gas that way. Um, so also what was the microbiome situation? Was the baby inoculated at birth by being born vaginally or, um, or not? Or did they have antibiotics or did mom have antibiotics just before birth or not? Um, also, is mom eating a bunch of things that are passing through the milk and aggravating the baby? This can really happen, especially if mom's digestive tract is not in great shape. Um, my best friend, Melanie, wrote the Calm Baby Cookbook, and you could get that at our office. That's Dr. Melanie Beingessner. She's a chiropractor. Um, we also use mild digestive stimulants in clinic to help stimulate baby digestion and get things going. Um, we also ask, is the baby stuck in a car seat all day without having enough movement? Because digestion a lot of the time is also movement. And you'll notice with newborns that they start being a little kicky pants. <laughs> and movement is always going to improve bowel function, just like it does for an adult going on a walk or on a hike. Um, there's also specific homeopathics that can help with colic. And if you like homeopathics, you can check out our acute care course, the one that I said you're going to get a coupon to at the end of this. Now, infant reflux or spitting up is another commonly dealt with issue that can get confused um, with, you know, normal spitting up. So how do you know if it's reflux or just natural spit up? Like I said, first of all, you're going to read the cues for burping. Because if there's an air bubble in there and it's uncomfortable, it can create some interesting symptomatology. And I think a lot of babies just are not burped enough. Um, usually. It, if the spit up's not accompanied by pain or discomfort or stress, it's just normal spit up. And it can actually look like a lot, like when it spits up or on the floor. And lots of women will say, well, they just puked up their whole bottle. Well, no, they usually don't. It just looks like a lot more when it is flat on the floor. <laughs> it's like the wipe up effect. Um, now, if they're really uncomfortable, they might um, do things that are more representative of, of actual reflux, like gagging or choking or coughing. They might have really bad breath, which for a baby is really unusual. They could be an excessive hiccuping or burping with a lot of frequent spit up or vomiting um, and fussiness and trouble sleeping. But like I said, the truth is that most of us um, just don't burp enough and all people reflux gastric contents totally normally without symptoms because you have a, a flap sphincter, sphincter in the top of your stomach. That means it's more like a trash lid than like an anal sphincter that closes. So, you know, positioning, you know, I would find that car seats, 
Um, they kind of put a babies in crunched up positions in a way. And a lot of the time you're going to see babies have difficulty with their abdomens when they're sitting in those buckets too long or sleeping in them too long. Um, a stressor in mom can have a huge impact on a small child because you're their world and your energy is their energy. So sometimes the spitting up and symptomatology is just coming from the fact that your baby's an incredibly good read on what's going on with you as well. Now, next up is cradle cap. Cradle cap is um, also known, um, the, the medical term is infantile seborrheic dermatitis. So big people can get this too, big adults. Um, and it's characterized by varying degrees of the loose, scaly, oily patch of skin on the top of the scalp. Almond oil or olive oil are great ways to reduce the symptoms of this. Just rub it on gently, leave it for 15 minutes. That loosens the scale enough to remove it with a fine tooth comb, like you see in this picture. Um, make sure to remove all the oil though afterwards because that can aggravate the buildup a little bit. So just use some, you know, mild baby shampoo, get that off. Um, gently comb out the flakes with a soft brush in between, you know, if it's just little surface flakes. Mm -hmm. Cradle cap can actually go over the entire body. And if your baby experiences that and or they're bleeding a little bit when you remove it, you just have to be really careful um, not to break the skin enough to create infection. I know it's it's unsightly and people don't want it to be on there, but a lot of the time it doesn't distress the baby at all. It just can look kind of weird. <laughs> so if you feel like they're really having difficulty with and you can't really control it, then um, come into the office. Several homeopathic remedies can help in this um, condition. And the most commonly used is calc carb. Um, that's a remedy that's especially used in large headed babies that are a little sweaty and sour smelling. It's most common baby to have cradle cap. Now there's a number of causes for diaper rash in babies and um, not all of them are going to be obvious. So almost all babies have a little bit of diaper rash at some point in their early months, but it varies a lot in degree and in cause. So diaper rash can just be simply caused from contact with pee and poop. If you leave a wet diaper on long enough, it can create a rash almost like a burn that's quite painful. And so this is the impulse behind finding agents that swell up on contact with liquids. If you use cloth diapers, this may also be more of a risk. Um, an ill-fitting diaper can also create irritation and rash in the diaper area. Products used on the skin can be very irritating, especially on a newborn, and a diaper rash can follow a change in a topical product. Um, we're going to talk more about that in a second. You can also have changes in the skin flora leading to infection. So yeast is the most common, um, but it can also be bacteria. Yeast can follow the use of antibiotics in mom or baby. It can also, a rash like this can also um, be from introducing a new food into mom's milk or in the baby who's old enough to eat, they can also start creating rashes by eating new things. So there's a couple things you can try with diaper rashes. You could try switching brands of diapers, or if you're using cloth diapers, um, change the detergent you're washing, washing them in to the mildest that you can get. Um, use coconut and olive oil as rubs. That just soothes the itchiness and other symptoms, and it makes a bit of a barrier. You can also use a zinc-based um, barrier cream. I personally like the Valeda calendula with zinc. Um, breast milk can also soothe the external ra uh, effects of a rash too, so you can spray that right on. There's a number of different conditions actually that respond really well to the immune factors and things in breast milk. Um, babies don't need to be washed all the time. So especially when they're really small, a simple sponge wipe will often be quite enough. Washing a baby with too strong of a soap disturbs the flora that was placed there at birth and from skin contact. And you really want your baby to be properly colonized with all those good bugs. And like I said before, don't remove the vernix if you, if you um, have a choice. It really protects the baby's skin um, before it's absorbing and it has a lot of beneficial properties, including being antimicrobial, and it defends your baby against infections there. It has a strong moisture retaining effect. It's actually so beneficial that a lot of skin care companies have researched the properties in the vernix that provide those factors to try and put in big people moisturizers. So when you do decide though, it's time for a wash, you wanna be careful about temperature and use a bathing agent that's more of a cream. And again, I really like the Valeda one. There's a calendula um, kind of cream bath it's very gentle, doesn't strip off those protective elements. Um, and like I said, be very careful about temperature. Babies really can't regulate their own temperature and they can get quite stressed by overheating and then chilling. And especially in the first days, this is just 
it can be enough um, stress to affect their blood sugar. So most kids don't need a lot of bathing. My view is they really don't need daily bathing probably until they're cute, close to puberty or if they really like, you know, are in a mud bath or something like that, then you can wash them off. Um, but just be careful with it. Um, most, the skin is really a self-regulating thing. Now, all babies will suffer from diarrhea at some point in their early days. Um, and if it becomes prolonged, it's, it's probably worth an office visit. Um, there's a couple of treatments that you can try. So, you know, if a baby's um, got diarrhea, don't stop nursing. You keep feeding, even if you suspect if it's something in your milk, because the biggest risk with too many loose stools is dehydration. And breast milk is actually the best thing to keep your baby hydrated. Um, you can try probiotics with people, with babies that have loose stools. We use HMF Natogen. So that's a probiotic that's really designed for babies that contain mostly bifidobacteria. And that can be mixed into breast milk or formula. You can get that from the dispensary. Um, if your baby's old enough, a little rice cereal can help because it's kind of one of those bland foods that binds things up a little bit. Um, we also use Nature Doc homeopathic diarrhea formula that you can easily get from our office if your child needs a bit more support. Um, also, if there's lots of stress in the mom, diarrhea in the baby can result. If you're kind of going on many, many days with diarrhea and your baby's not nursing while or is weak, then this is like um, a doctor visit or a, 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 a pediatric ER visit um, because little ones shouldn't have diarrhea that makes them that ill. Um, there are a couple of like viral things that can happen. Um, that you see like rotavirus is really common. And again, it's just a question of keeping a baby hydrated. Breastfeeding is the best way of doing that until it passes in you know a couple of days. Now, baby care stuff. Please just use the most simple stuff. You know, there's lots of things that you can even just learn how to make use of at home for your baby that are all natural. Um, we have like courses on using things in the essential oil and herbal um, ranges. And you can you can just make natural diaper rash cream or baby oil or shampoo and all that other stuff. If you make them at home, obviously they're personalized and you can make some more up as you need. But if you're not that crafty, my favorite is the Valeda lines. They're just really, really well made. They're really clean. They're all made out of organic stuff. They're using the principles of anthroposophic medicine. I think you'd really enjoy it. So um, contact us if you want for our recipes for natural baby care stuff, because obviously we can't take a look at all those here because we just don't have the time. Now, um, a lot of questions come around establishing routines. And yeah, it's true. A steady routine in early days can really help. Um, so routines include naps, changing, feeding, you know, personal care and support for you, <laughs> sleeping, activities that give the baby a chance to interact with their surroundings too. And the significance of the routine is that it creates rhythm. And that's an essential element in the energy of a human. So it's important to consider that you, you try not to rush children or pressure the routine to be too specific. Let it be flexible. What the routine will roughly be eating, activity of some kind, sleeping, and then you get to go and do what you want while they sleep. Um, and all the caregivers involved, like involved in the child's life, um, grandparents, babysitters, nannies, they all should know what you and your husband are observing or you and your, the father of your child are observing in terms of the routine. Because when you stick to those routines, um, it's very comforting for the child and also should be comforting for you because at the end of the day, um, if you both know what's expected, um, it just, it, I can't even explain it. Babies just love to have a rhythm. And usually once they have a rhythm, um, then you're going to see that repeating lots of different ways. So one of the best ways of seeing that is like napping. So everybody knows how crucial that napping can be. And if your baby's not getting sufficient sleep, you know, chances are parents aren't either. Um, a child almost always follows a regular sleeping pattern. So they usually get up, like I said, they eat, they play a little, and then they go back to sleep. When they first get up a lot of the time, they will do it the first time and then go back to sleep after for about an hour. And then they get up again and repeat. And they eat, they play a little longer, then they go back down. 
just observe what they do naturally um, and follow that pattern. Don't change the routine and disturb that, sh that schedule early on. Over time, um, babies will drop their first morning nap and then later their afternoon naps, usually over their first years. If you decide you want to put them at bed to bed at 7 p.m., a baby will get up at 5. Um, so you can make that decision for yourself. If you want them up at a reasonable hour for you, whenever that is, time it like that. At first, babies do not tell the difference between day and night. They don't know what day and night is. They only slowly get into that rhythm with a little bit of sunshine exposure. And almost all babies, uh, in my experience, will have a fairly regular rhythm. You just have to look for it and work with it. But one of the elements that you can control early is what time you decide, like, you want that six hour to eight hour window at night to be. So yeah, if you want to get up at five, all the power to you. Put your baby down at seven. <laughs> I put my baby down quite a bit later and they slept and he slept until my time, which was eight at the time. So I think he went to bed nine, 30, 10 and he got up at eight. It was still enough sleep. Um, and he's continued to imitate that pattern through most of his life actually, but he's always been well rested. So timing is everything. And that piece in the very beginning, you should be able to change if you don't like it. Um, if you let a baby catnap always in the car, that can affect a baby's sleep patterns at night. So can illness, um, so can vacations or disrupted routines that can really actually um, make sleeping habits really weird all of a sudden. So try and maintain the sleep order even if you're trying to take a vacation um, or doing no naps at all, um, like where a baby just doesn't have an opportunity to really lay down and rest because of the activities that are going on during the day. That usually happens a lot more when there's older siblings, honestly. Um, so while all this fussing and stressing is going on to ensure that a new baby has optimum holistic health, it's really important to not forget about you. So things like fatigue, respiratory illness, postnatal depression, and disruptive sleep patterns are all common in new moms, and it's so vital that you take care of your health as you assimilate into this new role. So you want to ensure your own proper nutrition and rest and, you know, gradually start with higher activity um, levels for yourself during the postpartum period, not immediately. Um, and partners of those closest to the new mom should be made aware of this important transitional time. So don't sell yourself short. While all the attention might be focused on the new baby, make sure you get enough um, space and time for your health too. So we're almost done with your time together. Um, and so I'd like to encourage you to share questions on Facebook. I'm happy to answer them for you. Um, also, as I promised, there's the coupon code for um, uh, the Acute Care for Kids course on the chat box to the side. I'm just going to see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, I'm going to just give you um, a coupon. So. If you look on the right chat box, you're going to see that the coupon or the link directly to that page is there. But the um, coupon code is newborn2019. So if you go to wholelifemedicine-learning.com, so wlm-learning.com, this coupon will give you 40% off the Acute Care for Kids course up until January 31st, 2020. So again, it's newborn2019 at wlm-learning.com. So thanks so much for coming to this event today. Hopefully you received some new and helpful information and some tips to help you provide more holistic health care for your own newborn. I'd love it if you take the time to comment with any feedback you might have on what we've covered and what your biggest takeaway is from this class. And I'm also planning to do some lectures um, on immunizations and vaccination um, strategies. I'd love to hear if that's a concern that you all have up on Facebook. So thank you and have a wonderful night. Take care, guys. Bye.